Hi, welcome attendees. Thank you for joining us for this panel presented by Folk Alliance International for Folk Unlocked. My name is Dina McLeod. I am the founding executive director of the Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa. I'm also the secretary of the board of directors for Folk Alliance International. And it's just an honor to be here today with you. Now, before we begin, let's take a moment to acknowledge that we are joined today by folks from around the globe using technology that is not accessible to all. We recognize the importance, complexity, and difficulty of land acknowledgements in the context of online organizing, creation, and collaboration. We invite you to join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to use this time together well, and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and active allyship. Further, I want to take the mo this moment to acknowledge that I'm tuning in from the land of the Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, and Osage. It is also the traditional homeland of the Caddo and numerous other native tribes who called this land their home prior to the forced removal. We respect their hospitality and we honor their history. We hope you will share your own acknowledgement as well as thoughts throughout this panel in the Folk, Un Folk Unlocked chat. This panel will be available for viewing for the remainder of the conference once it is aired at its scheduled time. Now, for this panel, we're going to be exploring how music has historically been used to inspire and motivate activism and how we see that continuing throughout history. We rally behind a positive message for change through melodies. As we look at current events, we see positive activism continuing that practice and see where violent actions lack that influence. You know, I couldn't help but pause during the insurrection recently and wonder where were the banjos? Where were the music? Where was the music? Uh, positive change always has a melody behind it. This discussion will explore music as a tool for activism through songs of change and the future. Now, I'd like to get started with this discussion right away. So I'm going to introduce each of you to our audience by asking you a first question. So for our panelists, we're going to start with Ashley Woodard from the Highlander Center. Now, when I think of the Highlander Center, I always go back to this photo of Pete Seeger, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Rosa Parks, and Therese Horton, and the thread of influence Highlander has had. I think of Woody and Pete at Highlander and the way Highlander was an anchor that artists hooked onto, inspiring so much activism. In 2012, Folk Alliance celebrated the Highlander Center with a Business Academic Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, we'll put that link in the chat so that you can see that as part of this presentation. Um, Ashley, for viewers here who don't know much about the Highlander yet, how would you describe the role the center played in the early civil rights movement? Awesome, thank you so much for the, the opportunity to be with people whose work I so highly respect. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Ashley Woodard Henderson. My friends and family call me Ash. I use she, her, her pronouns or anything said respectfully, and I'm the first black woman co-executive executive director of the Highlander Research and Education Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. Uh, and as a proud Tennessean, I'm excited to talk to folks who might be new to Highlander's history. Um, I think just to, to give you a, a quick and dirty of what Highlander means to Appalachia, to the South, to this country and internationally, um, is that since 1932, we've served as a catalyst for grassroots organizing and movement building. That's what we do. That's what we've done since 1932. That's what we do today. We work and rise in solidarity with people that are fighting for justice, folks that are fighting for equality, folks that in a, in a specifically in a 21st century context are fighting for sustainability um, and support their efforts to take collective action to shape their own destinies. We believe that the people most directly impacted by the social ills in this country and in this world are best suited to implement the solutions. And so we have a 186 acre farm in the foothills of the Smokies where we bring people together across their differences to figure stuff out, um, to become excellent uh, at learning and together and using that new knowledge to actually 
actualize a real change in the material conditions of their people. We do that through the study of particular methodologies that we believe are necessary to, to change the world, like popular education and language justice, participatory action research, cultural organizing, intergenerational organizing, and place-based organizing. And so you know, the, all of the intersections of the ways that these methodologies intersect support grassroots organizing and, and actually wins the social transformation of this world. And it's a privilege to be a, a part of this conversation. You know, I think to, to talk about the history of the Highlander Center is really to reclaim a, a grand inheritance of radical cultural work, right? So you've mentioned some of the, the, the OGs, I would call them, uh, of the Highlander Center. I think what's real is that there's a long legacy of particularly Black folks, working class folks, rural folks, uh, disabled LGBTQUI plus folks uh, who have consistently been at the spear's tip of cultural organizing in this country. And when I talk about cultural organizing, I really specifically mean that art and culture plus faith and spirit can change policy and practice. That's the methodology that we teach. Uh, we inherited that from some of the most incredible OGs in that work, like Zofia Horton, who you're going to hear more about, uh, like to follow Wala Muhammad and others. Uh, I think that, that why that's important, particularly in a moment like this, is that we are in a culture war, right? That actually does exist. You mentioned January 6th, and I would I would even go back before that to the to the bombing of our of our office, the arson at our office in 2019. Uh, the you know the bombing in Nashville on Christmas Day of 2020 that this rise in white supremacy and white nationalism is because there's a cultural effort a cultural organizing effort to tell white people that they don't belong in places that are diverse and inclusive and that they do belong in a space that is nationalistic and and full of white supremacy and I think that what makes the Highlander Center so special is that we've been combating that with, under the leadership of a black led multiracial united front. Uh, for almost 100 years, almost 90 years now, almost 100 years over the next decade. And I think that our commitment to doing that, not just being a living museum, is what makes Highlander so relevant in a 21st century context. That was beautiful. I mean, I think we all have, we all have some chills for the uh, absolutely amazing. And thank you so much for the work that you continue doing at the Highlander Center. It's inspiring every single time we talk about it. So thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna move on to Kim Rule. Um, now you've spent a decade researching Zofia Horton and the Highlander Center. And you have a book coming out next month. Congratulations, can't wait to read it. Um, I'm putting in my order right now in case you didn't get that. So uh, why did you feel it was important to research Sophia Horton and to tell her story? And can you tell us a little bit more about the role she played from your perspective? Yeah, um, so you know, I'm, my background is in writing about folk music and playing folk music. And um, so I kept running into Zilfia's name, researching the histories of various songs that were all linked back to her. Um, and initially that was my interest that there was this, you don't see women tied to folk music history, folk music scholarship really before Joan Baez started making records, you know, so I was interested in it from that perspective. But the more I got uh, into my research and the more that this story became about Zilfia more than just the songs that she was linked to, the more I started to realize that there was a whole role that she played in movement building um, you know, she arrived at Highlander just about two years, just barely over two years after the place opened in November of 1932. She came in February of 35 and um, as a student and she married Miles Horton three weeks later. Um, and it was a very intentional, I mean, they were in love, but there was an intention there uh, that they were both interested in sort of dismantling oppressive systems and they both saw marriage as part of that. Um, and so they entered, Miles called it their marriage of equals as, a, as a, an intentional way to sort of model uh, that behavior at Highlander. And he built the education program and she built the culture program, you know, which 
continues. I mean, a lot of people have added to it in the last 80 whatever years, but, um, but that program continues to this day at Highlander. You sing all the time and there's the food and the games and the, and the fire pit. And, you know, there's this place where you're discussing really heavy things in that circle in the workshop room. And then you go outside and you have to sort of process <laughs> what you've just talked about. And, and so Zilfia, you know, understood that that work of using music, uh, theater, there was a full theater program. People were writing plays when she was there. Um, there was, a, you know, the food, um, the, the garden, all the, all the elements, the expressions of culture were the ways that people connected uh, across their differences outside of those discussions. And um, so I think that it's really important, you know, she made a songbook and she played her accordion after dinner and everybody sang along, but there's this, all this other work that she really did, sort of the other half of Miles's vision that she built um, there. And that was the most remarkable thing to me because you think in 1935, to 1956 when she died that was her time there there's a lot of labor movement stuff they started to move into civil rights and some some stuff with the united nations at the end there but during that time you would have black labor leaders black labor uh representatives or 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 desegregationists coming to workshops that lasted for weeks um and there were klansmen there representing their unions so how do you get those people to hear each other, to work, you know, together? Um, you know, Miles used education and Zilfia used the arts and singing and culture stuff. Um, and she was, you know, the phrase a lot of people use to refer to her is that she was this radical caretaker. Um, so there was, there were all these elements of her, you know, people think of her as a musician, but she was this whole, presence there. Um, I think that's, that's a good starting place. <laughs> I could go on and on, um, but I'll stop there. Uh, I love that term, a radical caretaker. That's brilliant. Um, thank you so much. I love this way of introducing you all. Uh, this is, I think this is, I think this is fun because, I mean, we could read, everybody can read your bios, but uh, your insight is so incredible. Um, moving on to my dear friend, Bob Santelli, who's the founding executive director of the Grammy Museum and is working on an amazing exhibit that's going to open at the Woody Guthrie Center entitled Sound Songs of Conscience, Sounds of Freedom. Um, and I know that he'll have something to throw in about the exhibit itself in our discussion as well. So, Bob, uh, what are some examples of how music has impacted or been utilized for social justice causes? Um, how do you see the way that music influenced a movement rather than just a moment in our history? Well, you know, when we think about what has happened this past year or so, um, and the explosion now of um, of incredible music coming out of uh, everything from hip hop, R and B, folk, rock, etc. There's been a virtual explosion of music, uh, songs of conscience, and and uh, protest music. And of course, even though it doesn't seem like this, you can go all the way back to really the Revolutionary War times and begin to um, understand and and uh, identify how music has acted as an agent for social and political change in this country. So for instance, back in the colonial times, pre-revolutionary times, just before the war for independence, if you will, um, there were radical songwriters writing what we call broadsides. Uh, these were lyrics, revolutionary lyrics, uh, anti-British lyrics uh, pertaining to the Stamp Act or whatever it might be and uh, set to common English beer drinking songs or folk songs uh, that people would know. And uh, this was a great way to rally the masses, to share ideas and ideologies, and to basically get people on your side. And of course, that concept 
travels all the way through American history. And there are certain periods, of course, in American history where it truly rises and has a dramatic effect. And, you know, one area, of course, would be the labor movement, as someone mentioned already, in the 1930s, thanks to people like Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Almanac Singers, etc. Another area, of course, that uh, you can identify and really see the power is, of course, the civil rights music uh, and civil rights movement, where Again, new lyrics were written, and oftentimes the melodies were taken from traditional gospel songs from the black church. And then basically, if you look at it this way, um, I always thought the music of the civil rights era was actually the fuel by which the movement was was moving forward. Um, music can be, this kind of music can be very inspirational. You can imagine what it might be like uh, you know, staring down uh, a, a, a line of policemen with billy clubs and snarling German shepherds. And what kind of courage do you, how can you muster up the courage to move forward? And oftentimes, uh, the most effective way to do that was through singing and music. And that was a unifying purpose, but also it was the inspirational, uh, the rising your, your inner courage to move forward and, and deal with what was about to happen. Um, and then, you know, the, throughout the 1960s, of course, there were opportunities with the anti-war movement. Folk music gets involved, obviously, but also and then rock gets involved. And by the late 60s, you even have, oh, the Rolling Stones singing Street Fighting Man. And you have uh, um, uh, the Jefferson Airplane at Woodstock singing Volunteers for America. But then after the, you know, the eventual if you will, um, ending of the Vietnam War and the slowing down of the civil rights movement, we go into a dormant pe period where songs of conscience, sounds of freedom, uh, social protest, political protest songs begin to diminish in terms of its importance in American history, in American music. And then bingo, Black Lives Matter, it comes back with a vengeance almost. So today we're in a period of really, a, a, a period of resurrection for the idea that music can be used as an agent for political, social, racial, e economic change in this country. A brand new generation has discovered the power of music. And this is very, very exciting. And uh, there's a lot to learn from the music. There's a lot to be shared. Um, one of my favorite songs is Hers, I Can't Breathe. And you mentioned the uh, the exhibit we're working on called Songs of Conscience, Sounds of Freedom. That would be one of the showcase songs. But, but clearly there's been this whole history that I just mentioned that is reflected in this exhibit called Songs of Conscious Sounds of Freedom, which will open in May at your place, the Woody Guthrie Center, and uh, and then basically have a two or three year travel period throughout um, other museums throughout America. Thank you so much for that nice, nice promo of that exhibit that's coming to visit with us. Uh, and you provided a nice segue to our artists that we're featuring in this panel. Adia Victoria, thank you for joining us today. Um, now, as an artist, you know, it, it has to take tremendous strength of character for you to go beyond entertaining and accept a role as a leader to educate the public. Um, when you perform a song that's political in nature, um, that's intended to enlighten and educate, you know, how does that feel when you do that like the first time and the fifth time and then the 50th time you, does it does it change uh, throughout the times that you present it or and does it feel different to you what is the feeling of being able to educate and go beyond entertainment yeah. thank you for having me uh, first of all you know I would say that I don't consider myself a leader uh, in fact, I feel that I am following in the footsteps of Black women from the Deep South, uh, where I'm from, who have been telling their stories, who have been bearing witness to the ways that the world um, molds them, it shapes and informs them. So I'm, I'm learning as I go how to use my voice, how to center my narrative in a world that, you know, often sidelines, you know, Black girls that look like me coming up from South Carolina um, when I first got started, the first single that I released in 2014 was Stuck in the South. And I felt, you know, that this was a song, there was no other way that I could introduce myself to the public. I wrote this song um, the night that Trayvon Martin um, was lynched. That's what it was. It was a lynching. 
And it was, it was what was on my heart. It was what was on my mind. So therefore it was what was, um, on the pen and paper, you know, that I was, I was writing. And as far as like performing political songs, I believe that all art is political. I believe that, um, any artist that, you know, dares to speak about the ways that they are existing within the world, that's, that is a political act. Now, the way that we view politics in this country is that it's only if you're a marginalized person, then, then you're political, then your speech, your speech is political. But I believe that a For Florida Georgia line song that's talking about the way that we do things around here, that's, that serves a political function. You know, I think a, a Taylor Swift ballad talking about, you know, Tim McGraw and pickup trucks and blue eyes and, and fairy tales, like that's a political um, song. So my work is to, is to show you that I, I'm not, I'm not atypical in a way, like my speech, my experience is just as valid, um, as, as theirs might be. And I, I have grown into that, um, uh, confidence being able to say that, you know, my voice matters, my narrative matters just as much as, you know, a platinum selling, uh, music row endorsed artists. And I would even argue that it perhaps uh, matters more um, because I am I am offering a, a different perspective um, on our society that isn't that isn't sanctioned that isn't approved, and I think that it just um, allows me to see things with a different sort of clarity, um, uh, puts new eyeballs on it in a way. So yeah, I, I'm not a leader. I do proudly follow in the footsteps of Victoria Spivey and Ma Rainey and um, women like Bessie Jones that, that came before me. A lot of these women who are just one chain removed from slavery. And the first thing that they did was grab a microphone, hop on a stage, throw in some sequins and start telling some truth. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so now that we've had a little discussion about the history of activist movements, we're going to kind of go into more recent history. And I know that we've all touched on that a little bit. And this is going to be kind of a free dialogue. So, you know, jump in when you feel the spirit move you. And if, if you don't jump in, I'll call on you and volunteer you. Uh, but feel free to chime in or feed off of each other's um, remarks. Now, when you think about this panel topic, which more recent activist moments come to mind and what music was used? Basically, what's the movement, the moment, and the playlist that goes through your head as far as recent events? Yeah, I mean, I love this question. I think I love it in part because being a part of Highlander, being a part of the Black Liberation Movement, being a part of the Southern Freedom Movement, I think what's real is we live in the past, present, and future all at the same time every day. It, 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 the question is interesting because it's not just that we're in a particular moment, it's that we're in a pendulum swing of generations, literally decades, centuries worth of folks coming together to try to build another America for social good, right? I think, you know, my brother talked about uh, the songs of the Revolutionary War. And what I'd argue is that indigenous folks have been singing and dancing and using that as cultural interventions for, for long before white people knew about Turtle Island, right? So this, this country, literally the bedrock, the soul of this nation is rooted in the cultural expressions of marginalized and targeted communities. That's just what it is, right? And that that music, though, though white America may have ebbed and flowed and paying attention to movement music, there's always been a song, right? Whether that song was packaged as like, we shall overcome, right? And, and uh, I think when I, we talk about recent songs, it's like, well, that song never ages, right? What people don't necessarily know is that the royalties of that song before it was uh, sort of selfishly put back into the public domain, the royalties from that song came to the Highlander Center and a community of folks uh, that were connected to the to the movement of the 1950s and 60s would re-grant those royalties to Black communities in the South that were doing work at the nexus of art and activism, right? I, I think about, uh, you know, the, the folks that actually influenced and made Miles and Zilphia 
the, the culture bears and educators that they are, right? It wasn't just that white people had a good idea in the South, developed a Highlander Center, and that was the, the all good, right? What actually happened was folks like Esau Jenkins and Septima Clark, the world's best educator, and Rosa Parks and, and Jane and Hubert Sapp and, and all of these other incredible folks uh, actually came together and that the, the synthesis of their brilliance, right? The synthesis of their bravery, their, their courage, uh, their, their innovation, in a time where there was no internet and cell phones actually changed the trajectory of this country and, and had an impact on the world. So when you talk about contemporary stuff, it's like, well, you know, I think all of the, the, the songs that I inherited as a person in social movement, uh, whether that be the, you know, the, the, the incredible songs that my ancestors and elders sang uh, to, to fight and to believe in freedom's possibilities, or the, the hip hop that also was a, a form of cultural organizing and communities and, and narrative building and storytelling. Uh, but I also think about like stuff that came out recently uh, by some of my comrades, like Janae Taylor, one of the world's best cultural organizers, and Jonathan Likes, uh, who, who wrote the Black Joy Experience, right? The great album that came out of the Black Youth Project 100, BYP 100. Um, I think about all of the, the grassroots communities across this country who have developed chants and songs uh, that kept us like 26 million of us in the streets all summer. Um, there's so many examples of folks that are singing and writing and, and beatboxing for liberation that it's hard to narrow it down. And I think that that will always be true, whether popular culture actually pays attention to it or not, right? That these folks will always, folks in marginalized and targeted communities will always be using culture to shift the politics of this country. That's just that's just how we do it. Okay, and the only, the I think the one negative about having to do a, vir well, one of the negatives about doing a virtual conference like this and 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 this panel is that I want to take all of you out to dinner and, and just sit around and listen to you talk more. I would really love for, I, I want more of this discussion already. So, um, Thank you so much for that. Okay, next person. What do you think? What's the what's the movement? What's the playlist? What, what's if the I could, moment? It's Adia. If I could hop in. Yeah, you know, the way that I see this moment right now, you know, obviously I think that the the unrest that happened last summer with um, George, after George Floyd's uh, murder, is you kind of saw this expectation that it should be the, you know, black folks that were in the street marching and protesting, like, I think that there has been this um, expectation that Black folks would put their bodies on the line to, you know, raise the alarm and speak to what this moment is and define it, you know, for white people who are just now getting clued in that, gee, racism still exists. And one of the songs that I love that came out this past year was by my friend Jamila Woods. Um, she came out with a song called Sula, and it's based on the, the book by Toni Morrison of the same name. And, uh, and, the, and the song in the book is basically about Black women's autonomy, Black women defining, you know, their their life uh, as they see fit. And a lot of her work centers around the idea of solitude, the idea of rest, the, the radical aspect of Black bodies being at rest in this land that we were bought into to toil and to make profitable. So that's been something that I've been grappling with in my own journey, you know, during COVID is this idea of rest, of liberating myself from this, you know, a capitalistic, you know, hetero uh, patriarchal idea of productivity, of constantly having to be on and producing to prove that I'm somehow valid, you know, validating myself through my work and divorcing myself through my work. And that's something that Sister Morrison is still preaching to me that you are not the work that you do. So defining myself for myself, uh, that has been my sacred work, you know, during this past year of not telling, of not allowing people to tell me that I should be out there, you know, uh, risking my skin to clean up the mess that, you know, white folks have made. So for me, that is the challenge. That's been my soundtrack is, is black folks telling me, Adia, rest, take this time, reclaim your time, like Sister Maxine Waters said. Yeah, I mean, Adia just told the truth. I don't think there's much more to say. What I would offer to your point, though, sister, around like some of this is white folks work to do, um, is that there there are some folks that like if you are in 
to Americana music and you're looking for a 21st century manifestation of a P or a Woody or whatever, it's like, well, also there's just like some cool people that are doing it on their own. You know, like they're they're the, the grand inheritors of a legacy, sure, but they're also like white people who in a 21st century context are making their own way and doing it in solidarity, following particularly the leadership of black queer women like Nathaniel Ratliff and the Night Sweats. Shout out to the Marigold Project. Like you want to see folks that are doing it, white folks in particular, that are using their positionality to flank and support social movements that are really being led by the most directly impacted folks. Like he and his comrades in the band, his brothers in arms are, are a great example. And the Marigold Project, uh, which is essentially their foundation, is, is also an incredible uh, model for how to do this work in a way that isn't centering a privileged person in, in the arts. <laughs> and their opinion about what's important, uh, but creating space for artists of all stripes and modalities to come together to learn from folks that are directly impacted and then figure out what their place is in supporting the strength of the social movements. Because I think, as, as Adia said earlier, is like there's no neutrality, right? You are either bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice or you're hindering its ability to be bent. Right. And there's no neutrality in our art. You know, there's no neutrality in the stories that we choose to tell and the ones that we don't. And I think that there are some really incredible examples of both like folks from marginalized and targeted communities, whether it's like, you know, again, like folks in the Indian collective or, or the Black Joy experience or, you know, the incredible work that's happening with Mahente and other cultural organizing. But there's also examples of white folks that are doing everything in their power to get it right, too. Um, and there need to be even more folks that, as Ann Braden said, chose the other the other America. So uh, if folks are looking for examples, again, Highlander is a great place to get connected. Ah, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to I'm going to toss a question over to Bob. Um, the the next question that we have uh, that we'd like for you to explore, and I think it fits nicely with the things you were saying about the exhibit and the history of music as activism is just, you know, what makes a song or what makes music an effective rallying cry for change? What is it about a song that can do that? Struck by a, a, a phrase in the name of a documentary years ago that uh, was associated with Led Zeppelin. And, and the phrase is, the song remains the same. And it's both a, a truth and it's also uh, something that makes me sad and uncomfortable because when you look at the history of how music has acted or tried to act as an agent for social political change uh, and you go back say to the 1930s for with woody and pete and and others of that ilk um the things that they were singing about the things that they were trying to rally um, uh, support for are many of the same things that we deal with today. So, you know, the, the past is very much connected to the present and we can learn from the past uh, because the topics, the themes, the challenges, the fights are many of them are the same ones that were happening nearly a hundred years ago. And that's both sad and both interesting for me as a historian. Uh, when we think of um, immigration and we, we talk about the, the recent, you know, last four years or so and the, the issues of immigration in this country, and then listen to a song by Woody Guthrie, Deportees, and understand that the same thing that Woody was concerned with and wrote about in that song, is very applicable to today. Or if we look at the difference between the haves and have nots and, and listen to a Dylan song, let's just say from the early 60s, like the Ballad of Hollis Brown or something like that, and you realize what is happening with economic inequality in this country today. Well, it was with us back then. What that tells me, two things. Number one is the fight is endless. We can never rest, that there's always this battle to be fought in this country for whatever reason. And number two, that music acts as a form of inspiration. I mean, it's, music has this, it's a, it's a, it's a, an, something that connects with our emotions probably better than any other art form. And when you can sing and share it in a collective community, it generates power. It generates the ability to move not just people forward, but the ideas forward. And that's, I think, was what makes music so important to any movement in America. And without it, it it's, it's, you're really lacking one of the most vital weapons that you might have. Okay. Hey, Tim. So as far as your research on Zofia, what do you think she would want us to take away 
from her life and this discussion? Um, well, I think it, it's interesting to think about, you know, I, like I said, I came out of like the folk music world listening to recordings of folk songs. Zilfia was not in the recording industry. You know, she was working in the street, in the classroom, you know, like in the union hall, um, getting people who really are afraid to sing, she would get them to sing um, because she believed that um, it was an, it was an, the act of participating in singing was an organizing tool. You know, it didn't, didn't just galvanize people around an issue. It also was like making a promise to one another and everybody that heard you was in on that. You know, when you think of a song like We Shall Overcome, uh, Zilfia saying we will overcome that she learned from Lucille Simmons and the and the women of American Tobacco in 1945, 46. Um, you know, that song is not the reason that she pushed that song for a decade before she died in every meeting that she participated in um, was because that song doesn't say we who think the way I do will overcome or we will win or we we hope to overcome you know there was like there was this sacred solemn vow that happens in that song between the people are that are singing together but also between them and and everybody that hears them like we're in this if we're to overcome we're gonna have to do it together you know and so you know, I think that's an important piece of it. But the other piece that she would always talk about is these old songs that you pick up and you don't have to sing the words the way that they were written, right? You can change them. You can change all the words. If you don't, if that song doesn't mean what you need it to mean, make it mean what you need it to mean, first of all. And the other part is uh, when you sing a song like Sticking With We Shall Overcome, you have to think about everybody who sung that song before for more than a century, you know, like you're talking about the labor movement, the civil rights movement, Tiananmen Square, South Africa, you know, Tehran, like all over the world at this point, you are joining yourself to those people and you're carrying that work forward in the, in the like constant ongoing quest <laughs> to, you know, build a better world, to bend that arc toward justice. We are all part of this. And you pick you pick that up and you carry it a little further toward overcoming. So, I mean, that's the value of singing these old traditional songs that I think she would want people to think about. So, Adia, since, since you're the songwriter, you're the musician, how do you know when it's time to kind of dust off a traditional song and make it something new or when is it time for you to sit down and write something that's absolutely fresh from your soul uh, to capture a moment? You know, I don't, I'm of the faith that there's nothing new under the sun. I think that the struggles that we are having now are the struggles that my great grandma and her mother and her mother and her mother had, you know? Um, so I do lean very much into older, older songs, older folk tunes. There is a comfort there, um, especially for, Black folk to be able to trace your lineage back through song, to be able to locate yourself um, in this nation's history that has done its damnedest to erase you um, and to erase, you know, what your people have provided. And that's something that the blues did for me. It, it allowed me to uh, track um, my people's influence, my people's contributions to this culture. You know, my family goes back 400 years in South Carolina, you know, we're, we're as old as the dirt uh, down here in the South. Um, and, and that's something I've been doing a lot in COVID too. Like I've been researching a lot of um, from like the 1927 great flood of the Mississippi. And I, I was reading this book called deep in as it comes, which was just like this massive project that, you know, provided um, kind of clarity around all of the implications of that, that moment. And I wrote a song from that called Deep Water Blues about the expectation of Black women to provide labor, of expecting Black women to pick you up out of the flood, see you rise in spite of herself. And basically the song is, is me saying, 
that is not my job to be your mule. It is not my job to rescue you. Like you're going to learn to swim or you will drown tonight. And I understand that there's probably so many black women that felt that, you know, uh, throughout this nation's history of like just a frustration of, of people expecting you to save them and rescue them. And we see it now, like with Stacey Abrams, the work that she did in Georgia and people are like, call Stacey and, you know, she's going to save America, but it's like, who's going to save us. So this is something that's new. It's happening now, but it's been happening. And that's something that I'm, especially with this new record that I'm, I'm writing and working with, with T-Bone Burnett of how do we find the eternal in these stories? Like, how do we show that things don't really change, that we're still grappling with a lot of the same issues? And it's just been very illuminating for me. And it's been a comfort in, in quarantine, you know, that I have been so isolated to allow me to feel more connected to the Black folk that came and struggled um, before me. Okay, we are so excited for that record. Uh, between reading the book and listening to the record, I've got I've got so much excitement coming down the pike. I was er very exciting stuff coming up. Okay, we're gonna do a little around the circle, around the Zoom room. And uh, you know, let us know, what do you want the folk community to know? And what's your hope for the future? And we'll just start with Kim. Since we started with Kim initially, we'll just go back to her. Um, I, I would like the folk community to always remember that these old folk songs that have been around forever, um, you know, that this is how, this is why human beings make music. This is one of the points of, of music is to move us and to help us move each other forward in this world. Um, yeah. Ashley, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things. The first thing that I would say is that you don't get folk music or folk culture without black culture. Um, and so I would say, you know, not only remember the old folk songs, but also remember the contributions of black people to make that that sort of genre possible. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say like, remember how much, you know, hurt and harm how much, how much cumulative black death uh, informs the stories of struggle that, that come in the folk movement um, and folk and folk music. So I think that's one thing is you don't, you know, folk ain't just a story about Pete and Woody. Uh, it's a story about all the incredible black folks that they met along the way that influenced uh, this work. So I just, I, I think I have to, I'd be remiss um, and disrespectful to my elders and ancestors if I didn't start there. And then I'd say, secondly, what gives me hope is uh, social movements, man. Like we are now stewarding the largest social movement in US history, not because we started something, you know, six years ago with the movement for black lives or even longer if we think about since Trayvon Martin was murdered or even longer since the 1950s and 60s or, or the, the uprisings that happened against police brutality in the 80s and 90s. Even if I wasn't just talking about those things, right? This, this fight for abolition, this fight for, you know, divesting from systems of harm and investing in sustainable, healthy and equitable communities is generations old, it's generations old, right? And we're now starting to see the harvest season of some of that work. And I think that my hope is that those of us that still aspire uh, to, to be a part of, of a long tradition of folk music and folk art of all stripes and, and folk movements, right? Like Highlighter is literally a folk school. <laughs> If, if that is our if that is our commitment, uh, that we recognize that again there is no neutrality, that's a myth, uh, and that we really really are necessary to any successful transformation of this country and this world that we want to see happen in our lifetimes. And actually, that to be folk requires that of us, right? To be folk actually requires us to make a commitment to the grassroots communities that we're talking and telling stories about. Uh, that we that we are committed and required to to help support their liberation in our lifetime. And so, you know, I, I guess what I'm I'm hopeful about is that folks actually step into their grand inheritance uh, and, and step into this work of, of transforming the world with us and that we do it in right relationship. Uh, seeing that happen more and more is what's giving me hope. Lovely. Um, OK, Bob. Well, to, to the folk music community, I would say, um, I would remind you uh, that um, the power of music 
is just unbelievable. It's almost infinite. And that there are two lines of thought here. And one is that there is no responsibility for an artist to act in a political way with his or her art. The other is that there is a responsibility. And I believe in the latter. I believe, as I think some of my colleagues have said, that the, the music that you make, the music that you sing, is political by its very nature. And you should always be remindful of that. And you should also understand the power of music. When you think of the great cultural um, expressions that this country gives out on a, an annual basis since our very beginning, there's no question in my mind that music is the one that's been the most forceful, the most powerful, most influential, not just in our country, but in the in, throughout the entire world. So remind yourself of that and act on it. The second thing that I'm hopeful for, uh, really hopeful for, is, you know, as we've been saying here, uh, people, singers, songwriters, artists have been making music and have been, if you were reflecting and uh, identifying some of the challenges that this country has faced. But today we have an audience. We actually have a new generation, an audience, because an artist needs an audience. There needs to be someone to sing to. There needs to be someone to inspire. And we have that now in this new generation. And I'm a baby boomer. And, and you know, I look back, I have kids who are millennials and I see a new, I don't know, a new, a new sense of fire in them. And I think part of that comes from music. And so that's exciting to me. That makes me hopeful, makes me optimistic. And now with the artists doing their thing and the audience responding, uh, perhaps there is a chance for this, this change that we all look for and, 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 and aspire to uh, can maybe become a reality. Lovely. Adia. You know, I kind of think um, I'm going to build a little bit on what Sister Ashley said about, you know, what folk music is, who it is, who it speaks for and who it speaks to. I think that we need to see the circle of what we consider folk music expand. I remember back in 2019, I played the Newport Folk Festival and the most uh, uh, noticeable present presence of black people were black people who were dead, you know, Mississippi, John Hurt, Skip James, Big Mama Thornton, like they love to, you know, celebrate these people who are dead. But I would remind you that you'd be remiss to forget that the girl serving you your, your chicken at Popeye's, the black woman who is cleaning your hotel room, you know, the black woman who is uh, clean, pushing a mop um, through the school hallways, that's folk. They have stories to tell. You know, I wrote this lyric in a song. It says, I've been wondering about the stories that the river holds, the bones buried by them worth their weight in gold. Nobody tells their story, so they don't get told. They don't get told. They don't get told. So I'm I'm asking, you know, people in the folk community who are privileged enough to represent that community to decenter themselves, to allow these stories that have not been told, highlight them. Use your privilege to highlight these stories because there's still so much that we have to do to push folk culture forward, to acknowledge people's contributions that have been silenced um, and to center their perspective. And don't wait till you know, black folk, black folk singers are dead to give them their flowers. Give us our flowers while we're still alive. You know, pay us what you owe us because you're using this in your art. So show some respect. That's what I would say. Oh. Oh, that was just beautiful. Thank you, Adia, Ashley, Kim, and Bob for being with us here to discuss this. What an important discussion. Um, this session will be continue to be available as a recording on the Folk Unlocked platform all week. Please take a moment to provide feedback about today's conversation by posting in the comments in the chat. And finally, Folk Unlocked is made available at a pay what you can price point thanks to the generosity of our donors. If you would like to support our work, donations can be made at folk.org forward slash donate. Stay safe and connected community. See you soon. Woody Guthrie showed the world that one voice has the power to make a difference. He called for equality, justice, and peace for all people. Woody spoke out for the plight of small farmers, miners, migrant workers, and those who had fallen on hard times. 
His songs told these people's stories and encouraged others to join the fight for justice. What he wrote about problems in our world and how to fix them. His call for social justice still speaks to us today. The mission of the Woody Guthrie Center is to preserve Woody's body of work and to share his message of diversity, empowering a new generation to find the strength of their own voices. An important part of our mission is to promote those ideals that Woody promoted during his lifetime. And included in those are the idea that everyone should have equal opportunities, that we should uh, promote diversity and equality and justice within our society.